Hi, I'm Matthias Beck. I'm one of the authors of Computing the Continuous Discreetly. This video accompanies the last section in Chapter 2. I will give an introduction to techniques with multivariate generating functions. And at the same time, I will introduce an application to the mathematics that we've discussed so far. This application is about contingency tables. So what you see here is the easiest instance. These are two by two tables. But I hope the general picture will be clear from this example. So let's suppose I want to study dogs and cats in the small town that I grew up in. And there will be some dogs or cats with fur and some with hair. OK, so in this two by two table, I will record all four numbers. So for example, up here is the number of dogs with fur. To the right is the number of cats with fur. In the bottom row is the number of dogs with hair and then cats with hair. What I record over here is the total number dogs and cats with fur. Yeah, here the total number of animals with hair. And here I have the total number of dogs and the total number of cats. And these numbers over here are called the margins of the contingency table. Okay, so the uh, mathematical problem I want to discuss is the following. If you now give me a contingency table, let's say a two by two table, and the only thing you tell me are the margins, my question is, how many contingency tables are there that give you these given margins? There's an important practical applications to this. If you have data that's not dogs and cats, but that might be something more sensitive, often this data is just published in terms of the margins. And if you're in a situation where with a given margin, there's only a few number of contingency tables, then people might differ from your margins sensitive information about the population that you study. Actually, we will simplify this problem even further and assume that all of our margins are the same number t. Okay, this is a very special case and then I will record the number of such two by two contingency tables of this form with a function h sub two of t. The literature knows these functions with a capital letter h and two stands for the two by two case. I don't quite know why, but I will follow the notation that's being used elsewhere. Okay, so how are we going to model this? Uh, so for me, a contingency table has four entries. Maybe we'll call this x1, x2, x3, and x4. And so there are four constraints, namely x1 plus x2 is equal to t, x3 plus x4 is equal to t, x1 plus x3 is equal to t, and x2 plus x4 is equal to t. And then I have the constraints that each of my variable is a non-negative integer. And so this turns out to be an easy counting problem. I will let you think about this for a moment. Um, you can come up with a formula for h2 of t, sort of from first principles. But my goal in this video is to 
show you a technique how to compute this with multivariate generating functions. And the message that I'm trying to convey here is what we, we will be doing works in, in much more generality. So for example, um, the techniques that we'll discuss will allow us, for example, to change these margins or to uh, compute with higher order contingency tables. This is also a preview of sorts to chapter six, where we develop much more of the theory and computational background for this problem. Let's write down our constraints again. So we want to count all solutions, think of this as a vector, a four-dimensional vector with integer entries, non-negative, and we have the constraints x1 plus x2 equals t, x3 plus x4 equals t, x1 plus x3 equals t, and x2 plus x4 equals t. So here's a system that I would like you to think of as another example of the type of system of equations that we discussed in section 2.8. And uh, like in this section, let me first rewrite this uh, linear system as a matrix. So I have x1 plus x2, then I have x3, plus x4, I have x1 plus x3, and then x2 plus x4. So I have this matrix, everybody else is zero. I have this matrix times a vector x is equal to this vector with entries t, t, t and t. Let's not forget that I have the constraints that each of my entries is non-negative. Now I want to make just a small remark. I can think of this uh, right-hand side vector as t times the vector uh, 1, 1, 1, 1. So t is a scalar here. And I would like you to realize that you know, so what you see um, down in green is precisely a, a system like this. Um, and again, we have the uh, non-negativity constraints on top. And so what we're computing here is the Erhard polynomial of a polytope. In this case, my polytope lives in four dimension and I invite you to think about what this polytope looks like. We can't really draw things in four dimensions, but I claim in this case you can still tell me what the polytope is like. Now, to compute this, I'm reminding you of another technique that we've used in chapter one. So in chapter one we had this restricted partition function. I give you here the example with two parameters. And so I had sort of the defining equation was this one equation in the variables k and l. And out of this equation, we constructed a, a generating function. So this was using this geometric series. And then from this generating functions, we used partial fraction techniques to compute constant terms and to eventually compute a formula for this restricted partition function. I wanted to bring this up because we can think of the current problem that we work on in a similar way, but instead of scalars a and b, so these are given scalars that I 
compute linear combinations of, I now have vectors. So I can think of my column vectors of my matrix as given. And then by multiplying on the right with some non-negative integer vector, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm doing precisely the same thing as what we did with the restricted partition function. I'm computing linear combinations now of these column vectors, but again with non-negative integer coefficients, and then I have something on the right-hand side. So what we're gonna do now is translate this into a generating function that mirrors what you see on the bottom of this page. So again, let me remind you what we did in the case of a restricted partition function. In our counting function, we translate it into a generating function. And then our goal was to compute the constant term of this generating function. And this constant term was precisely what we're looking for. Okay, so this is our system now. I hinted at how we're gonna approach this. So what we'll need now is we need for each constraint here, for each equation, a variable. Maybe let me use the variables um, Z1 and Z2, and then W1 and W2 for reasons that will become clear in a moment. And so if I want to compute the analogous generating function, so this is now generating function in four variables. Well, let's think about how we translated this equation and the restricted partition function into a generating function this first factor, 1 over 1 minus z to the a, came from the first term, and then the next one, 1 over 1 minus z to the b, came from the term b times l. And then we divided by z to the n because we wanted to do a constant term computation. The analogous approach here is to think of this first vector as sort of again translated in terms of a, a geometric series. So if I take the geometric series one minus one over one minus uh, z1 w1 and expand that, you will see terms of the sort um, z1 w1 to some power, let me call this x1. The next column will be a geometric series 1 over 1 minus z1 w2. The third column gives me 1 minus z2 w1 and then I have a 1 minus z2 w2. And you can see I'm getting similar terms from each geometric series and now if you expand this out you realize what you want you want to find the coefficient for example of z1 to the t and then z2 to the t, and so on. And so an analogous to dividing by z to the n, what we did for the restricted partition function, um, we should now divide by each variable to the tth power. The upshot is that the constant term 
of this function. So this is a constant term in each of the variable will be this counting function that I'm after. We will compute this constant term with respect to one variable at a time. Let's start with a variable w1. So we can first see where w1 appears. So we have that here and then here. And then there's a w1 to the teeth power. And, and in fact, you can see um, something interesting that happens. There are terms for w2 and they look exactly like what I've circled in green. And so you have a phenomenon here that you know sometimes from uh, integration, multivariate integration. For an integral, you would say your integral factors, because you can see that the w1s, the w1 terms, the w2 terms don't don't mix. And so in this case, our constant term computation will factor. So whatever we're doing with respect to the constant term of w1 will be mirrored in the constant term computation for w2. Okay, so we'll do partial fractions. So let's just write down the terms that um, we're interested in. The rest is uh, constants with respect to w1. If I compute uh, a partial fraction expansion, I have a term like uh, some constant that we'll compute in a moment over 1 minus z1 w1 plus some constant over 1 minus z2 w1 and then um, I have um, I, a term for powers of w1 that like before this um, will not affect our constant term so in fact let's let's see what happens with the constant term uh, computation so if I do a constant term over here with respect to w1 on the right hand side I plug in w1 equals 0 so what's left is an a here and a b and that's it so let's compute these terms so a as before we have to take the limit as w1 approaches the pole so the pole in this case is 1 over z1 well we have to take the limit of the function where we um, eliminated the first term so what's left is a 1 minus z2 w1 and then w1 to the t this is just a z1 to the t um, divided by 1 minus z2 over z1 and maybe we want to rewrite this in a friendly way multiplying through by z1 so we have a z1 to the t plus 1 divided by z1 minus z2 b is completely analogous and so this constant term over here will be um, what we just computed Right, this is a and then if we to do the computation for B um, the roles of Z1 and Z2 are switched we'll do this twice right we're doing one computation for W1 one computation for W2 but they will get you exactly the same thing so at the end of the day, what's going to happen is we have this term squared. And then let's not forget what, what's left over from the uh, very first line over here is we'll have a, a 1 over z1 to the t and a z2 to the t. So this is what's left to do. We have to compute constant terms with respect to two variables that are left. We can compute this uh, square, so we have one square term 
and then there's a mixed term. And we have a minus sign, um, and then there's the other square. At this point, we have to be a, a little careful. So it now it matters actually how we are expanding each of these terms. So essentially, what you see here, we need to expand either something like 1 over z1 minus z2 or a square, so that, that'll be a derivative of sorts. And you know from geometric series that we can expand this in, in two ways. So I guess over here I need to uh, factor out a 1 over z1, or I can expand it like 1 over z1 over z2. Now I factor out a 1 over z2. And these expansions will be different whether or not I view z1 as the larger variable in absolute value than z2 or the other way around. So at this point, you need to make a choice. Um, it's arbitrary. Let's assume that um, z1 is the bigger variable. So I combine terms so we can see more easily what we have to compute. Let's maybe start with the uh, last constant term over here. Let me expand this. So we should um, divide by a z1 everywhere. So, so I get a1 minus uh, z2 over z1. And now let me think about the constant term in z2. Okay, what I have here is um, something that I can expand using geometric series. This will be a power series in Z2, no negative terms. And remember that T is a positive integer over here. So I have a term on top which will shift this power series to have all positive coefficients. That means that this constant term with respect to z2 is zero. And of course, that remains zero once I then compute the constant term with respect to z1. I claim the same thing happens when you consider this middle term. Exact same reasoning, essentially because you have a positive power of z2 up here, will give you a um, constant term zero. So here you can see what partial fractions gives us. In this case, we did a partial fraction expansion, and all but one of the terms actually survives in terms of computing constant terms. This is a, a nice simplification, and so what's left is to compute this last constant term. Magic. Okay, so let's do the same kind of expansion we just saw. Write this again as 1 minus z2 over z1. And the effect this has, it lowers the power of z1 upstairs. Don't forget there's a square. And so now I can compute the constant term iteratively. Let me say I will first compute the constant term with respect to z two, so this stays outside, and then we'll expand this, so we have the one over z two to the power t, and then this um, 
derivative of the geometric series, so this will be a k plus 1, and then the variable is z2 over z1. And what is this here? If I think of this as a function of z2, then um, my coefficient is a k plus 1 over z1 to the k, and combining the powers in z2, I have a z2 to the k minus t, and this means the constant term in z2 is precisely when k is equal to t, So what's left of this constant term computation for z2 is a t plus 1 over z1 to the t. So this is the coefficient when k is equal to t. And lo and behold, this constant term with respect to uh, z1 is now staring us in the face. This is hopefully what you came up with when you thought of this counting problem from first principles. And so this might be the most complicated way ever that you computed the quantity t plus 1. But I invite you to look back at what we're doing and realize that, for example, if we have different margins now, if we have several variables in terms of the margins, we can do the same kind of computation. So different variables in, would come in different places in our setup, but at least in principle, what we did here in the last few minutes, you can do in a more general setting, and then very quickly you will get counting functions that are of a more complicated nature than the nice little polynomial t plus 1 that we got in our case.